hello friends so i'll be talking on this hepatopulmonary syndrome so i hear this has come as a question in drnd exam so we acknowledge my colleague dr mega who helped me develop this content it's a brief overview with an emphasis on diagnostic tool that we can utilize on the bed side which is an agitated saline test so i'll just show you a video how we did it and how it has to be done so that would be the high point of this particular talk so what do we understand by hepatopulmonary syndrome so there is a basically dilatation of the pulmonary vasculature in the context of cirrhosis of liver advanced cirrhosis of liver which leads to hypoxemia so we'll talk about pathophysiology that leads to hypoxemia so there is sort of a pulmonary shunt intrapulmonary shunt that develop and there is a dilated pulmonary vasculature leading to hypoxemia so the incidence of hepatopulmonary syndrome is 5 to 32% in patients with cirrhosis and it is said not necessarily they need to have cirrhosis even presence of portal hypertension itself is one of the reason that they can develop hepatopulmonary syndrome and it is gen generally often tends to be seen in advanced liver disease but there is no linear correlation with the severity of the liver disease to the severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome so it can be vice versa so it can be in a varying stage of liver disease but hepatopulmonary syndrome may be present and may be severe enough and uh, or it may be advanced disease where not necessarily they can have hepatopulmonary so there is no linear correlation with regard to severity of the liver disease but the criteria is they need to have portal hypertension present for them to have hepatopulmonary syndrome so the diagnostic criteria for hepatopulmonary syndrome which is laid out is on room air uh, the pao2 should be less than 80 but important aspect is they should have increase in the aa gradient so aa gradient should be more than 15 so that is a criteria for all the severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome so which you will see in the, when you see the mild moderate severe aa gradient is one of the important criteria for patients who are age more than 64 years aa gradient should be more than 20 so this is the sort of criteria that has been put in place and the the diagnostic tools that that has been elucidated that it can be used is contrast enhanced echocardiogram but all these are theoretical because the simplest bedside tool that we could possibly use is agitated saline test and radio perfusion lung scan so uh, uh, so not necessarily all the centers which are dealing with cirrhosis of liver would have radio perfusion uh, sort of a uh, availability and uh, this is something which you can keep in mind that these are the tools that can be utilized and these tools can detect hepatopulmonary syndrome if the shunt fraction is more than 6% and as i have already said uh, the presence of portal hypertension is what is needed with or without cirrhosis because i'm sure most listeners would know that there are different causes for pulmonary uh, portal hypertension not necessarily with cirrhosis it could be portal vein thrombosis it could be splenic vein thrombosis it can be hypersplenism so on and so forth the presence of portal hypertension is what is needed uh as a uh, as, as a prerequisite for someone to develop portal uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome so when you look at the severity grading as i said there are mild moderate severe and very severe and if you see all the criteria aa gradient will be more than 15 in mild there is no severe hypoxemia in moderate the pao2 will be mildly lower at 60 to 79 but aa gradient will be more than 15 on room air severe they will have hypoxemia at 50 to 59 a gradient will be more than 50 on room air in very severe is possibly the type of cases that come to icu needing oxygen where your pa2 is less than 50 a gradient is more than 50 on non rebreathing oxygen or needing oxygen so this is very severe so severe and very severe are possibly the ones who come to icu needing oxygen and this is the case that we got in our icu where we established the diagnosis of hepatopulmonary and by doing agitated saline which all of you possibly should contemplate doing any cld who comes with hypoxemia where obvious other causes like fluid overload pneumonia so on and so forth are ruled out so just uh, talking about pathophysiology as i said at the outset in hepatopulmonary syndrome there is dilatation of the pulmonary vasculature so the whole uh, the fulcrum of the pathophysiology is the vasodilation that happens due to various processes so one of the process is there is endothelin release from the endothelial cells within the vasculature which leads to activation of endothelial nitric oxide synthase and this leads to production of nitric oxide and nitric oxide we all know is a 
potent vasodilator it causes. So, whatever pathophysiological mechanisms I'll be talking will lead to the vasodilatation due to nitric oxide. So, the inherent nitric oxide concentrations tend to increase due to various processes. So, the other way nitric oxide increases, there is sort of um, inflammatory cells uh, that, that, uh, that tend to occur in the lungs. So, there are macrophages and monocytes that... Uh, that are present in the lungs, which leads to production of tumor necrosis factor alpha, which again leads to activation of uh, intrinsic nitric oxide synthase, and that leads to production of nitric oxide and vasodilatation. So these are all different inflammatory. So there is endothelial cells which produce activation of nitric oxide, and there is inflammatory cells present in the lung that leads to production of nitric oxide. And there is a sort of angiogenesis that happens due to increase in the vascular endothelial growth factor. And uh, there is heme oxygenase, which tends to degrade heme and produces carbon monoxide. And this carbon monoxide also causes vasodilation. These are all the different processes which leads to vasodilation. And the pulmonary vasculature also gets sort of dilated. And, and the whole T-net of why hypoxia happens is because there is pulmonary vasodilatation, there is slowing of the blood flow, and there is reduced transit time for the gas exchange to act uh, occur in the setting of pulmonary vasodilatation. And that leads to uh, VP mismatch in the presence of shunt. So that leads to AV shunt. And along with this, it causes uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. And that is the cause of hypoxia. So if you sort of uh, pictorially remember this picture, there is a intrinsic vasodilatation that happens that uh, along with the AV shunts leads to VP mismatch and the hypoxemia sets in. So that is the sort of pathophysiological conundrum that happens in heptopulmonary syndrome. So there are two types of hepatopulmonary syndrome. So there is type 1 and type 2. So the type 1 hepatopulmonary syndrome, the AV shunts tend to happen at the alveolar uh, capillary sort of a junction or at the pulmonary vasculature at the alveolar level. So there is a shunt mechanism that happens at the alveolar level in type 1. And these are the better ones. They tend to respond to supplemental oxygen. So type 2 is where this shunt fraction happens at sites distant from the alveoli. So they can happen at any part of the parenchyma in the lungs and not necessarily at the alveolar capillary junction. So the type 2 has distant sort of a shunt present anywhere in the lungs. And these are the bad types which do not respond to supplemental oxygen. So there are type 1 and type 2. You can remember that. That's good enough. So clinical features, very intuitively you would know, in early stages, they are asymptomatic because mild stages, they are not hypoxemic. And uh, later on, as the disease evolves, they do get very dyspneic and uh, they can have exertional dyspnea and progressively it tends to get worse. And of course, there will be a uh, concomitant presence of signs and symptoms of CLD. So always some sort of a chronic liver disease, portal hypertension in the should be present along with ongoing hypoxemia leading to shortness of breath is the uh, typical clinical features. So the hallmark features or the striking sort of a feature of heptopulmonary is orthodeoxy. I'm sure most listeners would have heard of this term orthodeoxy from your medical school days where patients are not hypoxemic when they're lying down but when they sit down, when they come to the erect position, there is a drop in oxygen. So this is a simple tool that you can do at the bedside to determine. And we have seen it in ICU where when we when we prop up the patients, they tend to get hypoxemia. So so when 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 the patient is sitting up, so there is a drop. If there is a drop in oxygenation more than five percent or four millimeter drop in PaO two, we call it as presence of orthodeoxia. So this is something you can keep in back of mind, and this is a simple. Thing that you can do at the bedside to determine that orthodeoxia is present. And this orthodeoxia also tends to increase with severity. So now we'll just uh, play you a video on how this agitated saline test is done to determine the presence of uh, hepatopulmonary shunt, which leads to the hypoxemia. So just have a look at this three minutes video, which clearly tells you how agitated saline, which, which uh, all of us should contemplate doing in CLDs when other obvious causes are ruled out and patient continues to remain hypoxemic. So the whole talk is to emphasize on the ease of doing this test at the bedside to establish the diagnosis of hepatopulmonary syndrome and plan the definitive therapeutic modality, which would be, means once hepatopulmonary is established, 
one should enroll this patient for liver transplant. I think that would be the crux of the message from this talk. So just have a look at this video. So you have a peripheral line put in, as you see. So you need to have two syringes, one syringe with 10 ml of saline and another syringe with 1 ml of air because that air is needed to agitate the saline to cause micro bubbles. There is a three-way cannula that you need that needs to be put in and close to the patient. And then you agitate the saline. So basically you have 10 ml saline and 1 ml air in an empty syringe and you do the agitation. And there should be one individual who is doing an echocardiogram uh, to pick up the passage of these micro bubbles into the left atria and left ventricle. So, so this is a very simple thing. So the, it is an empty syringe with a 1 ml air as you see here. And this is a syringe with 10 ml saline. So as you see, there is agitation happening. The valve has to be close towards close to the patient and then you agitate. So you create basically that agitation is done to create the micro bubbles. So you know it is adequately agitated if it starts looking a little cloudy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you take the whole saline and inject it. Then you the echocardiographer should have an apical view there. So then you would have to do an echocardiogram. So you can see the apical view. So within, so you you are not meant to see that. So you are seeing the nice air bubbles. You are not meant to see it on the left side of the heart. If it's a cardiac trend, you will see the bubbles going into the left side of the heart within two cardiac cycles. If it is a pulmonary trend you will see it coming within five cycles. As you see here, it is coming within five cycles. You are seeing it in the left atrium and left ventricle. So this is when you call it as bubble test is positive. But this patient, it came within two cycles, as you see, because this patient has atrial septal defect. So I will show you the video of our patient where it comes in after five cycles, within five cycles into the left side. So this is our patient where we did the bubble. See, already bubbles are into the right atrium and right ventricle, you'll see it. This is a patient with PLD, so you see. Then it comes within the five cycles, it will come in the left atrium and left ventricle. It's a little tachycardic, and these are patients with PLD. So this was our patient. So it's a very simple test. So possibly one should think of doing in any patient with PLD to see if any, if all your bubbles come into the left side of the heart. So the other diagnostic tools that one can utilize is transesophageal echo is found to be superior to transthoracic in trying to determine the presence of the chance. And as I've already mentioned, radio perfusion scan is something that uh, can be thought of. And pulmonary angiogram is also could be contemplated. So all this I, I could, could possibly sense that these are all theoretical because many of places would not have many of these tests. And X-ray can be looked for adjunctive features because there is dilatation of the pulmonary vasculature. The pulmonary bay looks prominent. The pulmonary vessels look prominent. And it can be used as a clue for you that there is possibly presence of uh, heptopulmonary syndrome. And uh, pulmonary function test shows reduced lung volumes with the reduction in the diffusion lung capacity of the carbon monoxide. So DLCO will be significantly reduced. Uh, so these are some of the adjunctive diagnostic modalities that could be used. So unfortunately, when you talk about treatment, there is no definitive treatment. Only supplemental oxygen is something that you can give. There's no medical management when there is septopulmonary syndrome that is set in. So tips have been tried where you put a shunt between the portal vein and the hepatic vein, but this has limited data and it has not shown to be really helpful. So the most definitive therapeutic option is liver transplant. So one has to consider liver transplant for long-term survival benefit. And uh, in, in patients who have a big shunt where pulmonary artery is significantly dilated, they have tried to use uh, this endovascular coiling to close this shunt. So this is something that they have done when the shunts are very huge uh, in the pulmonary vessel. 
So prognosis, if someone has heptopulmonary syndrome, the mortality is doubled. So as it is cirrhosis of liver, they have a higher risk of mortality, but the mortality doubles up in someone who has heptopulmonary syndrome. And they tend to have poor quality of life because of their oxygen dependency, shortness of breath, so on and so forth. And the mortality is uh, directly proportional to the severity of the disease. So the more severe the hepatopulmonary, obviously the mortality risk also increases. So post-liver transplant survival has also been shown to be a little lower in someone who's had hepatopulmonary syndrome as a indication for liver transplant. So this is something what one should, so it's a very important prognostic marker to be kept in back of mind. So complications, obviously death is inevitable in these patients if no liver transplant is done. And some of them can be refractory uh, to whatever therapeutic modalities and they can be refractory to oxygen, like type two are refractory to oxygen, which carries a very bad prognosis. And post liver transplant also, these patients are at a risk of developing hypoxemia or some of them can develop protopulmonary hypertension in the post transplant setting. So which means the debility or the morbidity can extend even to the post transplant sort of a situation is what we need to keep in back of it. So that's about the heptopulmonary. So this, uh, I think in exam, if a question is asked, I think pretty much you cover this aspect, it should be good. I think the whole emphasis of this talk was mainly to understand, uh, to establish the diagnosis simple uh, bedside tool like the saline or bubble test or saline agitation test is something that you, you should possibly do for all CLDs where other causes are ruled out. And pathophysiologically, as you see, the 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 central cause for this whole thing is vasodilation in the ductus due to endogenous nitric oxide levels that tend to go up due to various mechanisms due to endothelin mediated or to the lung inflammation that happens, so on and so forth. So thank you very much. So I invite all my esteemed listeners to attend to our signature conference, Global Intensive Care Symposium that's happening from 18th to 20th in Bangalore. Also workshops will be happening from 17th to 18th October. So request our listeners to submit their valuable work to our Journal of Acute Care. And we have presenting this agitated saline test as a video CME in uh, each issue of the Journal of Acute Care. So go through it and uh, learn from the insights. Visit my website to rehead to this lecture. Thank you.